Hey folks, Alex here again. We are continuing our discussion of measures of central tendency. We have uh, spent the last 15 minutes talking about modes and medians and means, and we were just talking about now uh, how we can think about measures of central tendency linking to measures of variability. So uh, it's actually kind of interesting, I think, but maybe uh, that's just me. So one way that we can start to think about how the mean interacts with the actual values or the scores on a variable is by thinking about the sum of deviations from the mean. And, and think about it this way. If we were to plot you know, students and scores, and we have that here, students and scores, and let's say that you know, the dots or something like this. If we, you know, student A, B, C, D, E, F, G scores up this way, and we plot, you know, student C makes a 10, so it's right here, right? So we've got a scatter plot that shows the intersection between our two variables. And if we were to plot a mean, uh, let's say that the mean here is 5.7, right? That's supposed to be straight. And then we were to measure from each of these points, the distance from those points to the mean, right, this is just, I'm drawing lines indicating the distance from each of the points to the mean. Those below the, the mean, over here, that would be a negative distance, negative. Those above the mean, that's here, would be a positive difference from the mean. And it would look something like, like this, what we have here. For each student, we have their scores, we know the mean is 5.7. We take their score, we subtract it from 5.7. If it falls below the mean, the difference is negative. If it falls above the mean, the difference is positive. It's simply the deviations from the mean for each of the scores and cases in a sample. And if we were to do that, this is the difference from the mean, each individual score minus the mean and the member of the sigma suggests that we're summing all of this, we're summing or we're adding together all the deviations from the mean, hence the sum of deviations from the mean, and it always comes out to be zero. The sum of deviations from the mean for all of the scores in a, in a set always come out to be zero. Now that is a unique characteristic, and that's why it's the mean, right? It's, it's the anticipated middle or center of the distribution of scores. So the sum of deviations from the mean is zero, almost always. In fact, always. <laughs> the mean balances a distribution. That means that when I drew my little scatter plot here, right, with all these little scores that are the result of us plotting the x's and y's, and we put the mean in there, and then we look at the difference trying to draw the lines to the dots. Anyway, we add up all the differences. It's sort of like it balances. This, this side and this side get balanced somehow. And the mean, then, is a way to do something a little further. Yes, the sum of deviations from the mean is zero, but if we wanted to actually get a value, some, something other than zero that would suggest how far things are from the mean. So, for example, let me erase my ink here. We might have two different scenarios. Let's say we're collecting data. One data, this is with Lehigh students. This is with Lafayette students. All right? And with Lafayette students, when we plot the scores, they seem to be very widely distributed. And with the Lehigh students, when we plot the scores, they seem to be much less widely distributed. Now, the mean in both cases we'll say is the same, right? And if we just square, I'm sorry, if we just sum the deviations from the mean, right, in both cases, we get zero because the sum of deviations from the mean is zero. But if we square those deviations before we sum them, before we add them all up, we actually get a number called the sum of squares. The sum of squares is a way to start measuring, actually seeing uh, with your calculation, what the variability looks like. And the sum of squared deviations from the mean for this distribution would be much larger than the sum of squared distributions from the mean for this 
set. Right? And why is that? Because this one, they really are farther from the mean. Really, the distribution is very wide, whereas in this one, the distribution is very close to the mean. Right? So we start to get some idea about what variability looks like when we take the sum of deviations from the mean and we sum the squared deviations. So the sum of squares, which is what we, we shorten it to say, is a measure of variation that sums the squared deviations from a mean. I think we, we kind of knew that. Um, so, for example, here's our example one and example two from earlier when we were talking about outliers. Remember when we took 10 and we replaced it with 1,000, and I was originally using it to show you that the mode, median, and mean are uh, interesting when you have an outlier. The mode and the median stay the same, but the mean gets yanked way over to the side. Well, if we were to look at the uh, squared deviations from the mean, we get uh, some interesting results. First of all, here's, here's our students. Here are the original scores. Here are deviations from the mean. This is just each individual score minus the mean. If we were to add this group up, we get zero. Right? But if we square them first, negative 0.7 times negative 0.7 is 0.49. Negative 1.7 times negative 1.7 is 2.89. You see how that works. So we've squared the deviations from the mean, and then we sum them. We add them all up, and you get 88.10. This is when C is 10. When you replace that with 1,000, remember that outlier, and you do the same thing. Remember this? This would be 0 if we add these up, because those are just deviations from the mean but we're actually squaring the deviations from the mean first. And this C, whoops, I moved that whole thing. I don't know how that's possible. There we go. The C case is the weird one with the 1,000 instead of 10. Look at this squared deviation from the mean. And then when you add them all, up, and of course the mean becomes much bigger, so all of them become much bigger. Look at that sum of squares. 890,692, whereas with just a little old 10 here, it was just 88.1. So we get a really interesting picture of what the variability looks like in this set simply by playing with deviations from the mean. Now, one of the ways that we can also think about these distributions, obviously we have our sum of squares that we can calculate, and we'll get into some other things we can do with that when we talk about uh, measures of variability. But we can also talk about distributions. And you might have seen this before. It's often called a bell curve. Right? And it's simply a frequency counter. Right? Frequency. So we have um, score A, B, C, D, E, F, G. I'm just making stuff up right now. Those that occur here are the most frequently occurring. This is a unimodal distribution. Those that occur down here are the least frequently occurring. And usually what we're doing is we're looking at a set of scores, and this would be the mean, the median, and the mode right here. They would all be equal. The right half is going to mirror the left half, and they're often unimodal, although you, I, you could have a bimodal distribution that would be mirroring and um, you'd have at least the you, you might have all these being equal if you really drew it carefully you had the right set of data so we can talk about um, sorry symmetric distributions we can also talk about skewed distributions and skewed distributions are probably going to be more like what we see in the real world skewness simply is the extent to which scores trail out non-systematically in one direction of a distribution. If they're negatively skewed, that means that the left, they're left skews. They trail out towards the low end. So usually this is zero and this, we'll just make this 100 to make it easy. Right? So they, the, everything will be packed up here, but they will skew towards the left end. That's a negative skew. If they're positively skewed, they trail out towards the high end. So here we go again, 0, 100. That means all the frequencies are packed up here, and they trail out towards the high end. So let's just 
talk about it a little more. The skewness of a distribution affects the mean, but not the median. Again, the mean gets pulled over by those outliers. The median, that's, therefore, is usually going to be preferable to the mean for highly skewed distributions to find that measure of central tendency. Because just like the case with outliers, the, the distribution gets pulled over when there's an outlier. So here would be a negatively skewed distribution that trails out towards the negative end, towards the left end. Here would be a positively skewed distribution that trails out towards the right end, which is usually the higher scores. Okay, so now you know quite a bit. You know mean, median, and mode. You know sum of square, squares. You know about uh, symmetrical and skewed distributions. And so I just want to point out, this is from a, a, an article that was published in, I think, the Comparative Education Review a little while ago, using TIMS data, Trends in International Mathematics and Science Study. And it shows a table where there are means in core instructional assignments for math teachers of 7th and 8th graders. And so you have means for number of instructional periods taught, number of grades taught, percent of total instructional periods in math. Right? So on average, teachers in Germany teach 20.7 instructional periods per week. Whereas in Japan, they only do 16.1 per week. And in the U.S., they only teach 18.6 per week. And we have right here, we have the N. That's the number in the sample for each of those countries, Germany, Japan, and the U.S. And then we have a measure of variation between nations, which we'll get into later. But right now, we can just see, we can compare these measures of central tendency. Now, that doesn't mean that everybody in Germany teaches 20.7 instructional periods per week. But it means on average, it means the center of the distribution, the, the arithmetic mean of that distribution for Germany is 20.7. For Japan, it's 16.1. For US, it's 18.6. And if we had a sum of squares or some other measure of var variability, we'd know how tight that distribution was around the mean. Well, we don't have that right in front of us right now, but that would be helpful. And we can start by saying, well, on average, German teachers teach more instructional periods per week than any of the teachers in Japan and the US, on average, right? If we look at the number of grades taught in the current year, like sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade, ninth grade, again, the Germans are on top, 2.4 grades taught per year, whereas in the US and Japan, 1.5, 1.6. Most, in other words, most teachers in Japan and the US teach one grade with an occasional foray into another grade. So we can, we can suggest that maybe German teachers are teaching a lot more, they're dedicating a lot more time to instruction, and German teachers are teaching across grades a lot more. So they are not uh, focusing just on one particular uh, range of uh, curriculum or age of student or whatever. And then here we have an average of the percent of total instructional periods in math. So teachers were asked, how many out of the instructional periods do you teach are mathematics? And then there was a percentage calculated for each student. So if I'm a teacher in Germany, maybe I teach uh, three classes. Two of them are in math, one's in science. So uh, I teach math 66% of the time. It's two-thirds, right? Well, we can see that in Japan, they are much more focused on a single uh, uh, math instruction. 98 percent on average is what Japanese teachers uh, teach uh, in math. 89 percent in the US and only 57 percent in Germany. So they're teaching more instructional periods, they're teaching across more grades, and they're also the least likely to be teaching one subject, and spe specifically I mean math. So you can see how we, we have this basic understanding now of measures of central tendency. We understand what it means and how we can use it and how it helps us think about variability. And we also have this way of thinking about measures of central tendency to learn something or to think about what the distribution of our sample might look like. All right, there you have it. Now you're all experts. <laughs> Talk to you later.